thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you to Mary Miss, Nord, and Charles at the Cultural Landscape Foundation. I'm here to provide a broad overview of land art from the groundswell perspective. Uh, oftentimes, land art is the first on the chopping block when it comes to the quote unquote pragmatic decisions that museums make regarding their collections. Toward the end of my talk, I'll cite examples of land art that were created to be permanent and have suffered or been lost due to poor maintenance or the whims of bureaucrats. But some background on Groundswell, the exhibition and publication that Nancy mentioned. Using materials like earth, wind, water, fire, wood, salt, rocks, mirrors, explosives, American artists of the 1960s began to move beyond the white cube gallery space to work directly with the land. With ties to minimal and conceptual art, these artists place less emphasis on the discrete object and turn their attention instead to the experience of the artwork, however fleeting or permanent that might be, foregrounding natural materials and the site itself to create works that were large in scale and located outside of typical urban art world circuits. For many years, art historical narratives of land art have been dominated by men. Michael Heiser, Robert Smithson, Walter De Maria, et al. Uh, groundswell Women of Land Art shifted that focus and sheds new light on the vast number of land art works created by women artists whose careers ran parallel to their better known male counterparts, yet have received less recognition and representation in museum presentations. In 1966, Patricia Johansson created her first sculpture in a forest on a private property, uh, inspired by the ongoing discussions on the possibilities of horizontal sculpture that she'd been having with the artist David Smith as a student at Bennington College, Johansson constructed a 200 foot long line through a clearing using steel I-beams ordered from a factory welded together and supported on pipes that she painted red, lead, lead red. Titled William Rush, the sculpture was impossible to comprehend in its entirety from a single point of view and instead required the viewer to experience it by walking along its path. A year later, Nancy Holt first tour through the ruins of New Jersey. The ruin tour was realized on the site of a decrepit mansion where Holt led a cohort of her friends through a dense forest and landscape and the vestiges of this labyrinthine garden and estate. And through her verbal guidance, she focused their attention on details of the environment that might have otherwise gone unnoticed. With Stone Ruin Tour, Holt explored perception and visual framing by investigating the relationship between words and visual details. It was ephemeral, performative, and it represented the artist's impulse to travel and to perceive the American landscape in new ways. It also foregrounded the viewer as intrinsic to the work, completing it through the shared experience. Three years after Johansson cited her first sculpture in a clearing of trees, Mary Miss installed three V-shaped markers at 75-foot intervals across a broad New Jersey meadow. Simply titled V's in a Field, Miss's installation required the viewer to physically explore the terrain in order to grasp the marker size. Each V served to frame a view that only came into focus when one stood directly in line with the marker. Miss later expanded on this idea of focused perception with Battery Park Landfill, composed of five billboard-like wood panels installed at 50 foot intervals along the desolate Battery Park landfill from which the sculpture takes its name. Each panel measured roughly five and a half by 12 feet and bore a circular hole that appeared to descend into the landscape when viewed the when one viewed the installation head long head on. Uh, critic and curator Lucy Lapard noted in her review of the work, quote, the plank fences only false facades nailed to supporting posts on the back become what they are, not the sculpture, but the vehicle for the experience of the sculpture, which in fact exists in thin air or rather in distance, end quote. These works that I just introduced are just a few of the earliest examples of land art, varied in concept, materials, and execution, and inhabiting a range of manifestations, object, experience, performance, or ritual, they illustrate the, remarkably, the remarkable variety of artistic approaches that emerged in the 60s, flourished in the 70s and 80s. Common among these works by Johansson, Holt, and Miss, and those others in Groundswell, is this artist's immediate interaction with the land, the foregrounding of site specificity and experience, and the use of natural materials to evoke the landscape in abstract 
or non-representational forms. Groundswell Women of Land Art, the exhibition and the publication, reinforces these ideas and demonstrates further that land art is multimedia work. It is made in both sparse and unpopulated and dense urban landscapes. It is linked to the development and popularity of public art and art parks, and it resonates with art being made today. Groundswell features 12 American artists recognized for their sustained engagement with land art. You see all of the artists here, Lita Albuquerque, Alice Acock, Beverly Buchanan, Agnes Dennis, Marin Hassinger, Nancy Holt, Patricia Johansson, Anna Mandieta, Mary Miss, Jody Pinto, Michelle Stewart, and Meg Webster. And to be sure, their works represent just a small sample of the broad range of land art made by women in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. And while there are a number of other projects that and works that deserve special mention for the way they approach place making ephemerality in the landscape, those tended to represent isolated bodies of work within those artists' respective careers. The artists of Groundswell, however, produced multitudes of land art works throughout. So this exhibition, as I mentioned in the publication, looks at work made from the 1960s through 1990. And and both the exhibition and publication provide kind of a broad overview of themes and artworks that are integral to the understanding the history of land art. And while most scholarship on the field tends to focus on the decades of the 1960s and 1970s, um, I chose to broaden this time frame to allow us to kind of chart the emergence of land art in the 1960s, its quote unquote decline in the 1970s, and the artist transition in rural unpopulated settings to creating land art in urban centers with the emergence of public art programs and art parks that flourished around the United States in the late 1970s and early 80s. Conceived of as open-ended and constructed to stimulate further research, the Groundswell exhibition and publication themes offer points of departure for artists and future scholars. They also provide us with recognizable motifs and highlight uh, events that prov proved significant for a number of artists. For the purposes of my talk today, I'm focusing in on the themes of architecture and ruins and from land art to public art as works produced within these themes tended to interrogate the issues of permanence and care, which are so central to our conversation today. Artists like Alice Acock and Mary Miss and also Meg Webster, Beverly Buchanan invented an entirely new category of sculpture that married the distinct disciplines of architecture and art into sculptures that engaged and referred to the built environment. The art historian Andrew Cossey characterized such works as non-functional architectural models and constructions resembling fire towers, follies, bridges, ladders, uh, shelters, and enclosures of different kinds, such as tunnels an apt description of Alice Acock's simple network for underground wells and tunnels, or Mary Miss's Perimeter's Pavilion's decoys. Toward the center of the field, oh, I'm going to quote uh, Rosalind Krauss here, quote, toward the center of the field, there is a slight mound, a swelling in the earth, which is the, on which is the only warning given for the presence of the work. This is Rosalind Krauss uh, describing Mary Mrs. Primitor's Pavilion's decoys in her canonical 70, 1979 essay, Sculpture in the Expanded Field. Quote, at the intersection of landscape, architecture, and sculpture, the installation consisted of three towers, two mounds, and an underground courtyard marked with a beckoning ladder, all arranged across a four-acre clearing of the Nassau County Museum, a former private estate. The work raised questions of scale and perspective from a distance, the towers appear identical, but at close range, they were either smaller or larger than expected. Meanwhile, the underground pavilion, ringed with slot-like windows opening into indeterminate dark spaces, undermines one's sense of the solidity of the surrounding earth. In this and other works, Mary Miss uses the concept of the decoy, something that blends into to lure, entrap, or otherwise beguile an unsuspecting creature. I'm sure we will hear more about Mrs. Perimeter's Pavilion's decoys from Susanna. But the nature of this work really made it difficult to transpose it into a gallery setting for the Groundswell exhibition, just simply through photographs. So I worked with Mary to create the slideshow of work that would attempt to capture the dispersed nature of it, as well as the experience of not being able to grasp it all in one glimpse. 
Meg Webster, on the other hand, constructed outdoor rooms from rammed earth and native plantings to create enclosures and amphitheaters that hearkened to the sod dwellings of 19th century pioneers. She and this sculpture that we recreated for Brownswell in the galleries of the Nasher is titled Long Gates. It was intended to be entered, much like a room or a building. It's open at either end and it establishes space for viewers to see and encounter each other. She chose rammed earth for this sculpture, an ancient and sustainable building method that relies on compacted materials, in this case, a mixture of topsoil, sand, and cement with walls rising just over four feet. One choosing to enter Long Gates may feel held, but not constrained, viscerally in contact with the smell of the earth. Beverly Buchanan's early cast concrete sculptures, references to construction, building, and notably ruin, are likewise a form of architectural sculpture, as she writes in an artist statement, I quote, often when buildings are in a state of demolition, one or two pieces, frustula, stand out otherwise, never would have been created. This state of demolition presents a new type of artificial structure system that by, by itself, its undemolished state would not exist. These discards or piles of rubble can be pulled together to form new systems, and these new systems are very personal statements to me. They are inspired by urban ruins, but are created in my own image by me in concrete and painted with pigments. Buchanan incorporated these discards in her permanent site-specific work, Ruins and Rituals, installing abandoned concrete footers that you see here, alongside cast concrete sculptures in an arrangement on the grounds of the Macon Museum of Arts and Sciences in Georgia. In an unpublished article on her work, Beverly Buchanan recounted to an interviewer the casual sexism she encountered in her interactions with male contractors on job sites in her own artistic practice. Uh, I quote, Buchanan tell how Burke Slocum, president of Georgia Steel, donated the equipment and labor needed to arrange the grouping of concrete footers for ruins and rituals. She laughs when she tells how the foreman placed a hard hat, his hard hat on her head and said, we'll move these things as many times as you want us to and put them wherever you say. We were told you would probably change your mind a lot and to treat you like a woman moving furniture. Contractors were men, heavy equipment operators with commercial driver's licenses, concrete mixers, crane operators, forklift drivers, and freight haulers. Skilled tradespeople like electricians, carpenters, stonemasons were all men in a sector rife with gender bias obstacles to access such labor and skill were often insurmountable. Moving into public art, public art programs and art parks became an increasing, increasingly desirable option for artists seeking to make large scale works in the landscape, which required funding and support mechanisms. It was a way for artists, particularly women or artists of color, to also gain access to funding um, and support that um, would allow them to produce something that could be considered permanent. And while many land artists engaged in public art, making it some point in their careers, including every artist in, in the Groundswell exhibition, access to funding and support came with certain limitations, not necessarily aligned with the kind of sites traditionally associated with quote unquote land art, remote and accessible, often on private property. Many public art projects funded through percent for art programs, which allocate a certain percentage of the total budget of local scale large-scale building projects uh, to funding works of public art. As a result, there is a marked shift toward urban sites for land art that coincided with increasing popularity of public art programs in the United States in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Among groundswell artists, oh, I'm gonna shift head, sorry. So along with Beverly Buchanan's public artwork, the ruins and rituals that I just discussed, the artist's rural installation, Marsh Ruins and Blue Station Stones, uh, represented here on the slides, cited at a metro, it's a Blue Station Stone, cited at a metro rail station in Miami, uh, represent a nuance, nuanced, even critical approach to public art with sites chosen for their connection to historical events and Black communities in the South. They also function as case studies to understanding two drastically different approaches to maintenance and care, total neglect and unnecessary intervention. Marsh Ruins, for example, references the early 19th century mass suicide by drowning of people sold into slavery near St. Simmons, Georgia, just east of where Buchanan cited her work. 
Though the effect was unintended, the sculpture is flooded by tide each day, evoking the fate of the Igbo people who chose death over the alternative of slavery. And while it remains in the location where the artist cited it, the sculpture is difficult to find. It is, its condition has deteriorated significantly. The work is somewhat of an orphan without an official custodian to maintain it or draw sufficient attention to its whereabouts. Though some may say it suffers from this neglect, it is in keeping with the artist's desire to create a sculpture that would alter and change in relationship with the elements. Alternatively, Buchanan's Blue Station Stones represents an example of unnecessary or overzealous intervention. The color of Blue Station Stones derive, is derived from the cobalt pigment that Buchanan added to the concrete when casting the forms, which, she, as she noted in an artist's scrapbook, cost nearly $10,000 just for the pigment. This meant the material was compositionally imbued with color throughout, not applied as a surface treatment. And as you see on the slide I'm showing here, the, the image on the right is the color of the blue pigment in the concrete, uh, the, what the artist originally intended. And the image on the left shows the work as it, in its current state. Um, and you can tell there's quite a difference in this blue. At some point in the history of this work, someone charged with its care decided that the color had dulled enough to the point of necessitating a paint job and applied a coat of blue paint that was significantly different than the blue of the original work, completely altering it and obscuring the artist's intent. Additional examples of destroyed, neglected, or deinstalled works that are kind of local to where I'm from in Dallas include Beverly Pepper's Dallas Land Canal and Hillside. It is the earliest example of a work of land art in Texas, and it was commissioned by the Nasser Sculpture Center's founders, Raymond and Patsy Nasser. Um, Sadly, it was removed. It was, you know, it was built in 1970, and um, it was removed from its site in the spring of 2021. And as of this, as of the time of this talk, it has still not been reinstalled, and I have not been made aware of any plans to reinstall it. Other examples include Linnae Glatz, A Place to Gather, which was bulldozed in 2021 to make way for a parking lot or Francis Bagley and Tom Orr's White Rock Water Theater, a City of Dallas Public Art Commission that was removed after neighborhood groups complained about the lack of maintenance and care that the City of Dallas was unable to fund in its restoration. But let's close on a higher note. I return to examples of public artworks that are properly maintained and can be uh, experienced in the way the artist intended. Jody Pinto's first permanent public artwork, Fingerspan, is a publicly funded, functional, and participatory artwork cited in a heavily wooded area on the banks of the Wissahickon River in Philadelphia's Fairmont Park. A sculpture as footbridge in the form of a bent finger measuring 59 feet across a steep ravine, fingerspan signifies touch and the connection between body and land. Pinto's design and choice of materials, Corten steel, is continually in flux, responding to environmental condi conditions through a process of oxidization. And it yielded a work that was praised by art critic Paula Marincola for being, quote, so well married to its site, it appears to have been there for a long time, end quote. In addition to Mar Mary Miss's many public artworks, her 1984 essay on a redefinition of public sculpture addressed the changing needs of public space and the artist's role in bridging connections between developers, architects, art councils, local governments, and communities. Written as the artist was beginning work on South Cove, what would become her landmark public art achievement, Mrs. Essay provides an overview of successful and less successful examples of public art in the preceding decade, referencing her own public art projects in line with those by Maya Lin, Richard Serra, Robert Morris, and Klaus Oldenburg, among others. Miss later reflected, I quote from that now, it had become apparent to a number of us working in the 70s that the role artists had been assigned or accepted needed redefinition. Pursuing something apart from earthworks and site sculpture, we were interested not only in taking art outside the usual boundaries of the museums and galleries, but also in integrating it into people's lives. Often relegated to the status of cultural commentators, we felt it was essential that the insights and observations of artists actively shape our culture. We were interested in crossing boundaries, removing them, and occupying them as sites. It became apparent to our, in our complex time that collaboration within fields and across disciplines is essential.
end quote. The examples of land art that opened this talk, Johansson's William Rush, Holdstone Road Tour, Mrs. Bees in the Field and Battery Park Landfill, each epitomize the notion of an artwork that is impossible to comprehend from one distinct vantage point or to capture in its entirety through a single image. This concept reverberates throughout Groundswell. What Alice Acock wrote about highways in her master's thesis that, quote, the experience is such that the whole of the articulated form of the road can never be seen at, seen at any one time. And even from the air, the whole of the highway network cannot be seen since it spreads in all directions, end quote, could apply to any number of works in the exhibition or publication. Moreover, much of the land art women artists made was site-specific, intentionally ephemeral or unrealized, and a large portion of works that artists intended to be permanent have either been destroyed or suffered greatly due to lack of maintenance and care. As we consider these elements that constitute groundswell, the of condensing the movement and women artists' involvement in it to a single point of view or frame of reference becomes apparent. The vastness of the work and activities of women land artists exceeds our field of vision, vision and has resulted in a scholarly oversight, rendering their work invisible because it could not be reduced to a single defined image or conform to a more concise traditional narrative. The story told in Groundswell for the field of land art studies, bringing the practice of women artists back into view and revealing their radical, unique, and often frightening prescient works of art. Thank you. <laughs>